It is 1 a.m. in Washington, 8 in Kiev, and 2 on a Thursday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gan Young. Here's a look at your headlines at this hour. The latest on the post Hill Ferry disaster. The weather is hampering the search for more than 30 people who still remain missing, and the head of the ferry operator has been arrested. South Korea's defense ministry confirms that all three drones found near the inter-Korean border earlier this year came from North Korea. And following one of the nation's worst ferry accidents and ahead of local elections in less than a month, Korea's political parties elect new floor leaders. We'll have those stories and more, but first this. The final verdict is in. The three unmanned aerial vehicles recently found on South Korean soil did in fact come from North Korea. Now, Seoul's defense ministry released the findings from its over a month-long probe. Our national defense correspondent Kim Hyun bin has the details. A joint South Korea-U.S. investigative team looking into the three unmanned area vehicles that were discovered in South Korea over a two-week period starting in late March has stated definitely that they were sent from the north. The team's report says the drones were headed back when they crashed after running out of fuel. The GPS coordinates of the UAV show that they flew over key military facilities and took dozens of pictures, a clear violation of Korea's armistice agreement and a non-aggression pact which forbids the North and South from infiltrating each other's airspace. South Korea's defense ministry called it a clear military provocation, and they plan to submit the results of their findings to the United Nations. North Korea has hundreds of unmanned area vehicles in its possession, and dozens of others are believed to have flown over the South before returning safely to the North. When modified, experts say these surveillance-purpose drones could hold up to 10 kilograms of explosives. It's raised concerns about possible attacks, and the South Korean military admits a gap in its security. While it says it's well equipped to deal with enemy jet incursions and attack UAVs, they have a much harder time detecting these smaller drones. Seoul says it plans to purchase low-altitude radar and other military gadgetry to prevent further infiltrations. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, speculation continues to swirl that North Korea is gearing up to make good on its threat and conduct a fourth and a new form of nuclear test. South Korea is taking the threat very seriously, but it also has a warning of its own. Any nuclear test will be met with severe consequences. Here's our Song ji with this report. If Pyongyang pushes ahead with a fourth nuclear test and defies the international community, it can expect swift and strong punishment. This was the gist of the South Korean foreign minister's warning to North Korea when he said the regime would pay the heaviest price in new sanctions. During a meeting at the UN Security Council on Wednesday, Yoon Byung says said a test would have a huge impact on the strategic landscape in Northeast Asia and would pose a serious challenge to Beijing as well. We must clearly warn North Korea that if it challenges the international community with another nuclear test, it will be met with the most serious consequences. At the same time, Yoon stressed Seoul wants to build a peaceful and new Korean peninsula through President Park Geun-hye's reunification drive. But Pyongyang continues to verbally attack President Park's initiatives. The North Korean daily Rodong Shimon said Thursday, that Park's ambition is only stirring the potential for war. It also says South Korean government was fooling the nation with a diabolical idea. Meanwhile, the U.S. confirmed Wednesday that Secretary of State John Kerry met with Wang Jiarui, China's international director of the Communist Party. Wang, considered a key messenger between China's Communist Party and North Korea's Workers' Party, is believed to have discussed a possible resumption of the six-party talks on North Korea's denuclearization. Song ji Arirang News. Now, over in Africa, security concerns are overshadowing the three-day World Economic Forum in the Nigerian capital of Abuja amidst new reports of more violence. News of a 12-hour assault in the northeastern border town of Gambora Ungala belatedly surfaced as local media reported Islamic militants believed to belong to Boko Haram indiscriminately attacked an outdoor market Monday using 
improvised bombs and rocket-propelled grenades. As many as 300 people are feared dead. Meanwhile, Nigerian police are offering a $300,000 reward for information that leads to the rescue of the more than 200 missing schoolgirls. This as help is coming from the U.S., the U.K., and France. Now, Paris said it is sending security service agents there. London will send a team of experts to work with the U.S. team that will establish a coordination cell at the U.S. Embassy for support in intelligence investigations and hostage negotiations. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Moon Gon Yong, live from Seoul. Ball shopping market for the dual use of the Korean name E C and the Japanese name C of Japan in school textbooks in the state of Virginia. Let's now move on to the latest on this whole affair disaster. Now into the 23rd day of search operations. Uh, to bring you up to speed on the recovery operations as well as the ongoing investigations, we have live um, our Connie Kim at the News Center. Connie, uh, what are we learning of late? Well, Kanyang, today is Parents' Day in Korea and at Pengmokang Harbor, which is the closest land area to the accident site, the parents of the missing continue to wait for their children to return to them. Now, no additional bodies have been found since one victim was recovered Wednesday morning. Currently, the confirmed death toll stands at 269, with 35 still unaccounted for. The search efforts resumed early this Monday at uh, this morning after being suspended for about 20 hours due to harsh weather conditions. Divers have succeeded in entering the kitchen on the third floor and the central part on the fourth floor where most of the victims are presumed to have been at the time of the accident. Now, although not much progress was made yesterday, the tides are at their calmest right now, giving divers a better chance at recovering more bodies. They'll have a similar condition at 7 this evening. Now, officials say the rescue team will attempt to comb through the 64 cabins once more, including restrooms, a cafeteria, and 47 other common areas. The search outside the ferry has expanded expanded, increasing up to 80 kilometers from the accident site. So far, the rescue team has found four item belongings to the victims, items like shoes and clothing on Chindo Island. Well, um, it sounds like an extremely difficult time down there for uh, search crews, uh, who must be, I imagine, exhausted. But uh, the investigations into the sinking are ongoing as well. Now, uh, Connie, what's new on that front? Right, Kanyang, a representative of the Changhejin Marine Company, Kim Han Sik, was arrested earlier this morning on charges of homicide by negligence. The prosecution had issued an arrest warrant last night for Kim, who is now being transported down to the Incheon District Prosecutor's Office for questioning. And it seems it'll be difficult for Yu byung the former Hemo Group chairman and practical owner of the Changhejin Marine Company, to avoid facing charges. The prosecution have found an organizational chart which was used secretly among employees within the company, a chart that shows evidence that links you to the business operations of the company. You formerly denied overtaking any official positions within the company and having any company shares. Also, a 10 a.m. deadline for some of Yu Bangan's closest aides came and went at a little over four hours ago, with none showing up. Now, one of, the, now one of those who were due to appear was Yu's second son and who is abroad. He may now be forced into the country with the help of the FBI and Yu Bangan and his first son may be summoned first. Also, Captain Lee Jun-suk and the Seoul's key crew members may face another charge for neglecting to answer an attendant's question on whether to direct passengers to get off the ferry. The joint investigation team will look into whether there were any technical problems and whether the captain and his crew members did not answer intentionally. Right, and another uh, news that we're learning of that's probably not going to help authorities regain trust that they have lost from the public, the number of survivors and uh, the missing has been changed yet again, and I believe this is about the seventh time that the number has changed. Tell us more about that. You're right, Kanyang. The Coast Guard has once again changed its previous data of the rescued and the missing. The chief explained that they believe additional Chinese passengers were on board, with the rescued being adjusted from 174 to 170 and the missing passengers standing at 304 from 302.
The reason why the number has gone up is because we found credit card receipts from two Chinese nationals who weren't on the passenger list. Now, the problem here is that the Coast Guard has confirmed two additional passengers but did not release the increased number of missing passengers. So far, they have released a number of victims but not the missing and said it has taken some time to track down the exact number of missing. Well, this is all I have for now, but back to you, Kanyang, in the studio. Our Connie Kim on the latest on the Seolho Ferry disaster. Now, the entire nation remains in a state of shock and grief over the Seolho sinking more than three weeks after the ferry capsized. But the place hit the hardest by this tragedy is Ansan, as it is a city that most of the victims called home. Arirang News Shin Se-min reports on how the city is coming to terms with their grief. A final trip around the school they once attended. For the 11th grade students of Tanon High School who died in the Seolho Ferry tragedy, this drive through campus in a slow moving hearse signifies their last visit. It's also meant to bring some sense of closure to the living who are grieving over the loss of so many young lives. Ribbons and countless notes adorn the fence outside the high school letters and messages that read, I'm sorry, please come home safely. It's hard to find anyone in the city of Ansan who doesn't know someone directly affected by the disaster. I came here to see those kids enter school in funeral hearses. I have a grandson who is a senior and attends the school. It breaks my heart to think of the suffering the teens and their families are going through. <laughs> Kojandong is among the hardest hit neighborhoods in the city. The working class area, composed of simple brick apartment buildings, was home to 109 students that were on the ferry. What used to be a bustling school zone filled with groups of teenagers has changed. Residents describe a stillness now brought on by the loss of a high school and loss of the city. Grief has shrouded the city of Ansan, which has a population of 710,000 people. It permeates every corner of the community and has taken a toll on local business. Shop owners say they've seen a considerable drop in their number of customers. The area is grieving over the students who have died, such young students. It's completely understandable that sales have dropped. The tragedy has brought this community together. The city's residents seek out comfort at a mass memorial hall in Parang Park where they come to console one another. A sign that the tight community stands together in this most difficult time. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. And today, May 8th, is Parents' Day here in Korea. And while it's a day many Koreans spend time with their parents and show their love and appreciation for all that their folks have done for them, this year, hundreds of parents are aching with sadness after losing their children in last month's Seolho Ferry disaster. While marking this day, President Park Geun-hye on her Facebook page vowed to make Korea a very safe place to live so that the parents of the victims will not be hurt anymore. A majority of victims from the second ferry were high school students from the city of Ansan traveling on a field trip to the island of Jeju. President Park also thanked all parents in the nation for their sacrifices and devotion in raising their children and doing their best to foster talented individuals. And on the political front, the ruling and opposition parties are electing their respective floor leaders on this Thursday. The ruling Senate party a couple of hours ago named its single candidate Lee Wan Gu, new floor leader, without a vote alongside his running mate Chu Ho Young as the head of the party's policy committee. He is a member of faction close to President Park, while Chu is part of a different faction. Now, as the opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy heads to the polls this afternoon, or actually in their, um, they are currently holding the polls, uh, the floor leaders will be elected there. The four-way race between lawmakers from different party factions is expected to determine the dynamics of party leadership. Now, this follows the merging of the former Democratic Party and independent lawmaker An Chosu's party in March.
The Korean won's strength against the U.S. dollar is raising concerns among local exporters who stand to lose price competitiveness overseas. But as our Hwang Ji-hae reports, it's the small and medium-sized enterprises that should be most concerned. The Korean won continues to hover around its highest level in nearly six years, currently trading at the 1,020 level against the U.S. dollar. Last month, the local currency strengthened more than 3 percent against the greenback, the biggest appreciation among the world's 40 major currencies. While experts predict the Korean won to remain strong for the time being, with the nation's current account balance remaining in the black for a prolonged period of time, they believe that the impact on local exporters will be limited. I don't think it'll have that big an impact, but I do want to remind people that, well, during normal times, Korean won was always around a thousand dollar, a thousand won per dollar. Right. Uh, in just before the uh, Asian financial crisis, it was in the high 900s, and right before the global financial crisis, it was around a thousand. Mm -hmm. So it may be that the uh, period we had for the last four years was sort of the abnormal period, and we were just getting back to normality. Experts say what's really worrying are the small and medium-sized companies that are not fully prepared for the changes in exchange rates. Well, the government uh, for the uh, small and medium-sized companies, they instituted things like exchange rate insurance. Uh, now, uh, two problems. Uh, one is that it's not as widely known as it should be among small and medium-sized enterprises, so they don't take advantage of it. And then the second problem is uh, the amount that they set aside for it may not be enough to cover a lot of the uh, SMEs. So uh, that program and other programs designed to hedge against exchange rate changes uh, should be made uh, larger and uh, it should be uh, advertised more. With concerns lingering that the economic growth could be hurt by slowing private consumption due to the Sewarhu ferry disaster, coupled with the strong local currency, the government has announced it will hold an emergency meeting led by President Park Geun-hye on Friday. Hwang Ji-hye, Arirang News. Well, the stresses and strains of modern life make some people seek a release in the form of alcohol or cigarettes. Latest figures show that more Koreans are actually turning away from smoking, but they are spending more of their money on alcohol. Statistics Korea says the percentage of a household's monthly expenditure on cigarettes has tumbled year after year for almost a decade now. Korean households spent around 17 U.S. dollars a month on tobacco last year, about 0.7 percent of their total monthly spending down sharply from 2008. But households uh, spent slightly over $10 a month on alcoholic beverages last year, which is over 0.4 percent of their monthly outgoings. The corresponding figures in 2008 was in point, uh, point percent or 3 percent range. Now, when it comes to life satisfaction, Koreans rank near the bottom of the list. Korea scored six points out of ten on the OECD Better Life Index 2014, placing it 25th among the 36 nations surveyed. The index measures the happiness quotient of a nation based on 11 categories, namely education, work and life balance and health. The average for the 36 nations came to 6.6. The OECD cited Korea's propensity for working long hours for its low ranking. Koreans work an average of 2,090 hours a year, which is a much higher than the OECD average of 1,765 hours. Australia topped the list of most satisfied countries, followed by Norway and Sweden. And now it's time for our daily arts and culture segment. And of course, our Im Yoon Hee joins us live in the studio. Good afternoon to you, Yoon Hee. Good afternoon. So uh, today is Parents' Day here in Korea. Exactly. So I would imagine you have um, some events for us for Parents' Day. Right. So there are a few events here in Seoul. But let's first start with the musical drama. So a musical drama is a little bit lighter in terms of content than, per se, your average drama. And um, it also heavily relies on the uh, drama. Pardon me. 
it's much lighter in content than your average musical, but it also relies on the drama content as well. So very exciting to watch. And so this particular performance um, hasn't been on the stage for over 10 years, and now it's been brought back with the help of some veteran cast members who many of our parents are quite familiar with. So let's take a look. It's the very first night, but she's already been abandoned by her husband and left to fend for her child. This story is about a woman's fate. A Fleeting Spring Day is a musical drama, sometimes called an operetta, and hasn't been on the stage since 2003. After an 11-year break, this performance is back with a veteran cast. This is the first time I'm doing a musical drama, and it's honestly a little tricky starting from the lines to the whole performance. It's a mix of light music, dancing, and acting set in a traditional time period weaved together on the stage. The result is a crowd pleaser, especially for the middle-aged audience. Not only is this musical drama good for the younger generations, we're recreating the songs from the old Madang Nori. But it would be a waste if we just stopped there. This light-hearted production has been away from the stage for years. But this recent revival is already piquing the interest of many, especially the actors, who have each had years of experience in the business. I've been doing musical dramas for 15 years, but this is the role I've wanted to do the most. Also, this type of acting is an upgraded version of the acting I did 10 years ago. In a market mostly controlled by foreign productions, this Korean traditional musical drama will hopefully bring a boost to the Korean domestic market in a fleeting spring day. You know, Yunhee, I'd like to know what musical dramas are, um, you know, compared with the musicals, how are they different? Right, so I mentioned briefly earlier that it's a little bit lighter in uh, content in terms of rather than a musical and so uh, musical dramas really combine this uh, sense of, of a story whereas but they also have like you know a fun a fun storyline to tell the audience as well as you know musicals are very entertaining to watch there's some dancing some singing it's a very uh, overall very exciting performance. Well, well rounded right, performance. Right. And uh, this particular one, it seems like um, it takes place uh, during a period when, uh, when uh, which our parents saw, you know, the tumultuous times, a transitional uh, period for this nation. Right, so which is why when these, uh, this generation or this, that age group watches this performance, they really seem to enjoy it. So when it first debuted in 2003, um, it was very popular. It actually showed at the Seoul Art Center as well as the National Theater of Korea, so both very big venues. And so it did very well there. And so now that they have these uh, cast members back with this, you know, very popular, very famous, well-known artist, you know, the, it is doing quite well as, again. I'm sure it is. Um, now, what other events could we find for this Parents' Day? Right. So today, I think the weather is kind of brightening up. It was raining in the morning, mm -hmm. but um, there are some beautiful art galleries here in the city. Uh, the Sochogu has Seoul Art Center, which is very uh, popular, and there are a few art galleries there as well. Chongnogu also is home to many beautiful art galleries and exhibitions. Now, if you want to, I guess you could say, kill two birds with one stone, you mm -hmm. could take your parents to a dinner show. And there's Imi Ja. She's a very famous artist, and so she has a dinner show tonight along with other artists, so definitely a lot to do here in the city. Right, Imi Ja is someone that our parents' generation exactly. would love to uh, hear her sing, and she is in her 70s, but a remarkable performer nonetheless. All right, Yuni, thank you for that report, and uh, we will see you next week. See you then.
The conditions in Jindo have taken a turn for the worst with strong winds and high waves hindering the search efforts. However, the things are forecast to calm down in the coming hours. And thankfully, the neap tide period continues, bringing slow tides, so let's just hope for the best. Now, for the rest of the nation, last night's rain has cleared the air and the temperatures have dropped, putting the highs into uh, 24 degrees. So make sure you are prepared for that. Now, going over to our satellite for details, it's still raining in the west and still foggy elsewhere so however th everything will clear up as we proceed into the day now going over to our temperature readings our tops out at 20 this afternoon meanwhile the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will peak up to 21 and 23 degrees now moving over to other regions Jeju Island tops out at 19 Dokdo at 15 while Mount Kumgang tops out at 14 well that's all I have this moment I'm Michelle Park and back to you Kanya Thank you, Michelle, for that. And that's just about all for me at this hour. I'm Moon Gun Young. Check back with us at 4 p.m. Korea time for Business Today.